All right, so now we're going to be talking about motion along a straight line. And what this really means is that where you know you can compress the the situation to one dimension. We don't need to worry about two dimensions. So something's just going straight, um, or for instance, a car going along the road. Um, you don't need to worry about three D motion. So some examples of 3D motion or of 1D motion are uh, a train going down the track. My younger son is obsessed with trains and this is one of his favorite types of trains. Um, well, they're all his favorites. Um, so, you know, a train going down the track is, is constrained to one dimension. So you can talk about the train going down the track uh, approximately as one dimension, um, at least for short periods of time. Um, a bicyclist riding down the street in a straight direction. Um, so assuming that they are not turning, um, you can talk about their motion in one dimension. Um, someone walking back and forth in, in one direction. So not going around in circles, but just going back and forth. I don't understand who would teach in heels and a skirt that looks very uncomfortable. Um, and you talk about, uh, you can talk about displacements. And again, the displacement is, is dis the displacement vector is from the origin. These would show, these can show, for instance, um, displacements from, maybe not turn my notations out. So you can look at here, this is a displacement from this point, and this could be a displacement from that point. So now we're going to talk about velocity. So you are familiar in your everyday lives with the concept of speed. And speed has the same units as velocity. But velocity is a vector. So velo velocity is going to tell you how fast something is going and its direction. So velocity as a vector, we have to write it as a vector all the time um, and start drilling into your head that uh, as soon as you have velocity, your answer must be a vector. Now, sometimes we're sloppy in one dimensional problems. And if, uh, if it's a one dimensional problem, when we ask for the velocity, you might get away with the speed and then sign. So in one dimensions, um, if you have defined the velocity relative to some origin. So here, um, we are going to draw, uh, bear with me, I have to click the right buttons to use annotations. Um, so we're going to draw the origin here um, as at Jill's house. And I always draw an X and a Y, even if we're talking about one dimension. Um, so we're going to measure her velocity relative to her house. Um, so you can fix a velocity. Um, I do not like the, um, okay, this is giving you the displacement. You can fix the velocity um, by giving a direction and, uh, um, and a speed. So here, this shows you where Jill is. This is showing the displacement vector as a function of time. So Jill is half a mile from her house, and we will um, we will call um, this t equals zero, the initial time, and then we're gonna say that after let's see in about twenty minutes, Jill's a fast walker, so to walk walk about three miles an hour, five miles an hour. Uh, you can walk about 10 kilometers per hour if you're a fast walker. So uh, then this is going to be, if she's walking 10 kilometers per hour, then this is going to be about three minutes. And then she is one kilometer away. Ooh, I've, yeah, okay. She starts to turn around, but she doesn't actually turn around. Um, and we'll call this six minutes. We're just going to make every time interval the same. 
And this one is at nine minutes. Okay, so if she is half a mile from her house, 50 equals zero. Um, and she is still half a mile from her house at three minutes later, the magnitude of the velocity is going to be the change in distance. So the average velocity, we can denote an average like that. The average velocity is the change in distance over time. Her average velocity between these two points is zero. Now, this is her displacement vector. She's one kilometer away from her house at six minutes. Between three minutes and six minutes, she has gone half a kilometer. So her average, the magnitude of, that, of her average velocity, and I can put vertical bars there to indicate magnitude, is going to be half a kilometer in three minutes. Three minutes is 180 seconds. And so she is traveling, well, I can't do that math in my head so much, but she's, she's traveling at um, one number for every 360 seconds. Um, now, this is when my choice of numbers turns out physically unrealistic because I set her to be a fast walker walking 10 kilometers per hour. So at nine minutes, she's all the way back in at her house. So that means that between three minutes and nine minutes, she traveled one whole kilometer and in 180 seconds. Um, now, I set this up so that she, um, so I, I set this up so it should be about 10 kilometers per hour. So that's saying she's going 20 kilometers per hour. But that's showing you how to calculate. So the displacement vector, um, if I show you, um, so the displacement vector is the one that was drawn on the sign. And then if I, I draw the velocity vector, the loss vector between these t equals zero and equals three is zero. Now the average velocity vector um, at this point in time points in this direction away from her house and the average velocity direct vector in the other direction is twice as long in the opposite direction. All right, now <clears throat> this used different units than I did, so different numbers. So this is going to show you, Jill, this, said, this is saying, uh, this is saying she ended up half a kilometer from her house after 10 minutes, and then back at her house after 20 minutes, and then a mile away after, well, this is a little shy of 20 minutes, and this is a little more than 30 minutes. So um, this is showing her velocity vector as a function of, er, sorry, her position as a function of time. So we can calculate her velocity for this. Her velocity is the, well, the magnitude of her velocity is the slope. Um, so here, the slope is, I need to, oops, it's very easy to accidentally flip slides. So for this unit of time, the slope is half a kilometer for every, we're gonna call that eight minutes and it's positive um, because she travels eight minutes in our positive x direction or eight, half a kilometer in our positive x direction in eight minutes and then in this period of time it's going to be negative half a kilometer in eight minutes and then in about the same amount of time 
that's this one. In the same amount of time, she travels away from her house again and ends up one kilometer away, uh, or sorry, in twice the amount of time on this, uh, she travels one kilometer away. And if I try to estimate how long, it does indeed look like it's 16, um, 16 minutes. So she travels one kilometer in 16 minutes and her, her velocity is positive here. And then she turns around and goes at the same speed in the opposite direction. So she's traveling one, a negative one kilometer in 16 minutes. So in these one dimensional problems, we usually don't, um, we often do not fuss with writing it as a vector, although I can, um, but we watch the signs very, very carefully. When in doubt, when you're answering problems on an exam, you should um, just give a vector just to be, if you're not sure what the instructor wants or ask the instructor just to make sure that you're doing what the instructor wants on the exam. Okay, so I also can write the velocity, for instance, at this first point as half a kilometer per eight minutes in the positive x hat direction. Or if I want to use different notation, um, I can put half a kilometer per eight minutes in the first component of a vector and then just list all of the components explicitly. Any of those notations is valid. All right. So here we figured out the velocity by calculating the slope. Now, the, the instantaneous velocity is the slope of a line tangent to the curve at that given point. So this class has a um, has calculus as a co-requisite. Um, this is a calculus concept. So if you're just taking calculus now, these are going to be new concepts. All right, so the, a tangent line is the line that just barely touches the curve and here when I hit the wrong but if I try to draw on the screen and I'm not in annotation mode, it, it flips the screen. Okay, so here, this is the tangent mode here. This is the tangent mode here, the, the tangent line there. And then often what we do is it, in practice, if we're dealing with real numbers, like uh, what we did here um, or here, you um, are, just going to calculate the average velocity. So the purple line shows the average velocity between the, the two points that are connected there. The green line shows the, um, the average velocity between this point and that point. And what you're doing is just what you know from algebra, which is rise over run. Um, so uh, hang on. Not right now. No, I, I'm going to post it on YouTube. I don't want you on YouTube. Um, so this is showing the different average velocities. Um, and here you can do another example. Um, you're, you're given the position versus time um, of, a, I don't even know what object. It doesn't matter. Um, if you want to calculate the slope, you just do rise over run, um, half a meter in 0.5. Oh wait, let's see. Each of these units, if we, we if we're reading a graph, we want to be really careful. So yeah, that this is 0.6, and so halfway through is 0.5. So uh, the here, the velocity is half a meter in half a second or one meter per second. Here, the velocity is zero meters per second because the slope is zero. And here, we can say in two seconds, it is half a meter in two seconds. So the slope is half a meter per second. 
and it's negative now because the uh, um, because the object is going back towards the origin. Okay, so here you can see that same, what we just did by hand, at first the velocity is one meter per second, and then zero, and then negative half a meter per second. So one thing that you are often going, you're going to be doing is taking position versus time graphs like this, and making them velocity versus time graphs like this. And you can do this numerically. Now, if you have a um, wiggly curve, you can estimate the velocity at a, at a few reasonable points and start drawing the line through there. So here, um, in these particular cases, um, this is showing you the position um, and then the, the velocity and then the speed. Okay, so here you have at the beginning, let me go to annotation mode, at the beginning you have a positive slope, but then here you have a slope which is zero, you're at an inflection point, which means that the object is turning around. So if I want to, um, I can go over here to my velocity versus time graph. There, my line has to go through zero because we are at an inflection point. And then the velocity becomes negative after that. So this is an example where the math works out neat. This particular object is a parabola, so the slope is a straight line. Um, when you're just sketching things, if you were sketching and didn't know the exact value, you would not know that that was exactly a parabola. If I ask you to sketch it, it's okay if it's at least a little bit wiggly. Now, in contrast, here you can see the speed versus time. The speed is the absolute value of the velocity. So at the beginning, the velocity and the speed are identical. Um, but when your velocity becomes negative, um, the curve turns around. Um, so if you are calculating your speed, if you're driving between Knoxville and Nashville, it doesn't matter if um, you're, for your speed, it doesn't matter which way you're going, but for your velocity, it does. Now, acceleration. So we say, uh, going back, we say that the speed is the derivative of the position versus time graph. Um, now, the acceleration is the derivative of the velocity versus time graph. So a derivative is how fast something is changing. The chain, so the, the speed is the change in distance over time. The acceleration is the change in Sorry, this, the velocity is the change in distance over time. The acceleration is the change in velocity over time. Okay, so trains, trains, trains. This is dedicated to my younger son. Um, so acceleration tells you whether something is speeding up or slowing down. And even here, we can tell that at this particular point, the acceleration, so the, the velocity is decreasing, so the acceleration is negative. Uh, the object is slow, well, it is decelerating, it is going in towards the negative direction of whatever our coordinate system is. Okay, so if you have an object which is initially traveling east, and we are going to define our coordinate system. Um, when I'm doing, when I'm working out a problem, I always like to explicitly draw it. So we're going to draw positive x is going to the east. Um, and initially, we start out going east, and we are undergoing constant acceleration. So we're constantly going to be 
moving the velocity vector more and more in this direction, and eventually it turns around. Um, so then it ends up traveling to the west. So the acceleration in this case is going to be in up. The acceleration in this case is in this direction. So the acceleration is changing the velocity vector to make it move in the negative x direction. OK. Racehorse is accelerating out of the gate. Um, OK, so this is a good strategy for problem solving. You want to identify the coordinate system. And you'll notice that I was already doing that, even though I didn't explicitly tell you to. The first thing that I do is that I draw the coordinate system. Um, so here, this is saying positive x is to the east, negative x is to the west, positive y is to the north, negative x is to the south. OK, so then to always get in the habit of drawing the coordinate system, then identify what you actually were given. You were told the initial velocity. So if you're told the initial velocity is 0 and the final velocity is negative 15 meters per second, that's what you know. Now, what do you want to determine? This can mean parsing the, the problem. So this means reading the problem carefully and making sure that you actually know what it is asking you for. So if the problem asks you for the acceleration, you actually have enough information now to determine what that acceleration is. So the acceleration is the change in velocity over change in time. Um, we weren't, let's say this is one second. So I need to do this numerically, I need a time. So we will say that we also knew that delta t was one second. Now, a change, this delta means change. We're always going to do final minus initial. So I said our change in velocity was one, our change in time was one second. Our change in velocity is negative 15 meters per second divided or minus zero. So we have an acceleration of negative 15 meters per second squared. All right, so that's our acceleration. And as I said, the acceleration is the slope of the um, is the slope of the line tangent um, to the um, to the curve. So the line that just barely brushes through it. Um, we often will calculate average velocities or ad average accelerations, which is not quite the same as the average um, as the exact is the true acceleration. All right. So the true acceleration is the slope of the tangent line. We can sometimes approximate that. Um, all right. So if you have a velocity versus time graph, which is linear, it is going to have a con a, a, an acceleration, which is constant. Uh, so here you can see an example. This fits with what you know from algebra. This, if you have a straight line, its slope is a constant. Um, and so here in this particular case, the, the slope is negative and constant. So the acceleration is negative and constant. The velocity starts out positive and moves negative. Um, and the acceleration is constant. All right. And here, you can see a couple of examples. So if the velocity is a position of time, is um, this is roughly a parabola. Well, this is probably exactly a parabola because it was drawn in a textbook. Um, and then you look at the slope of the tangent line. So um, that is going to, that tells you that here, the slope, the acceleration is positive. 
here it is zero and here it is negative and it keeps getting more and more negative so if the um if the if this curve is exactly a parabola its derivative is exactly a straight line um, so here if this is your velocity you can tell here's your acceleration is zero drop a line down your it tells you that your um so your it tells you where the acceleration has to go through zero all right so a few different examples um here you can see a few different this is an acceleration versus time that's negative but goes back and forth um here this is something that's jumping around so here what we can do we're going to do a couple of these examples sketching it now i want to distinguish between a few different words and if you're if you're not in my class then you should check with your instructor by by what to figure out what they mean when i ask you to sketch something i mean get the gist of it but you don't have to have numerical values exactly right if i ask you to, to graph it that means the numerical values better be basically right. Okay, so here, you, this is a velocity um, versus time. And you can see that this acceleration is constant. It's positive because the slope of this line is positive. Um, so I am going to have if I'd want to draw the acceleration, and I'm just going to cheat and use the same axis, and we'll just do arbitrary units. Now, my acceleration is constant, and I could even tell you what it is. It's roughly, so it's going to be 20, mile, 20 kilometers per hour per half hour. Um, so it's 40 kilometers. Um, per hour squared, and I'm so I'll just use those units kilometers per hour squared. Now kilometers per hour squared are not SI units; they are not Système International units, um, but they are valid units for the acceleration. So here, this would tell you that your acceleration is just constant between the two points. I'm not even going to try to get it to scale here. I know here the slope is zero. So if I draw my acceleration, um, again, we'll use, we'll, well, we're going to use arbitrary units because it's easier to draw. Um, the slope never goes negative, but it starts out really high. And then most of the, it falls. So it's almost zero by the time that we are near the end, and then it starts, it slowly drops off and loses that, that last little bit. So when I, if I ask you to sketch an acceleration, get the gist so that you can tell right here, this is a, a larger speed, and this goes to zero. Um, but if you sketch, you don't have to get the numerical values right. If you're asked to graph it, you should you should do the best that you can. Okay, sketching velocity and acceleration, position versus time. So if I am asked to sketch, and I think that yeah, these go through it, um, but not in detail. So if I'm asked to plot the velocity the way that I always do it is say, all right, the velocity is, oh, right, this is, yeah, these are different examples. Here, the velocity has got to be zero there, and it's got to be zero there, and it's got to be zero there, because we have an inflection point, it turns around. It looks like it turns around there. Um, here, it is very large and, and negative. So if I want to draw and I have to extend my axes, I have a large negative velocity and it reaches zero 
and then it's got to go between C and E, it's got to go positive and then back down to zero. It gets pretty large, but not quite as large as we started on. And you, between E and G, it does very much the same thing, but the maximum velocity is a little lower. And then between G and L, it does about the same thing. But again, the bump's not as high as it was at first because we never get up to quite the speeds that we had over here or even over here. here. So that is a sketch of the velocity versus time. Let me just put velocity versus velocity there. So that's the sketch. It's catching the qualitative features, but I'm not bothering to get numerical things exactly right. Okay, now velocity, and I want to calculate the acceleration. Easiest point. This is starting out positive. Very quickly. And then it goes briefly negative. And then it reaches, actually, I would even say this is another zero point, briefly negative, and then turns around. And then it's a very low value until it turns around. And then it shoots down and becomes super negative. When I'm grading this type of problem, the first thing that I do is look to see that you got the zeros right because the zeros are the easiest. And the second thing I usually look for is to make sure that you got the sign of the slope right. All right, free fall. So this is any time that you have something on Earth, roughly near the surface of Earth. Um, so you can treat the acceleration due to gravity. And on Earth, the acceleration is always 9.8 meters per second squared. Um, and a few, we often neglect air resistance. And what that means is that we're going to assume that the air is not slowing things down. So um, in the absence of air resistance, the acceleration is the same for all objects. So they would both fall at the same time. Um, so in a vacuum where there's no air, the hammer and the feather are gonna fall at this, are gonna hit the ground at the same time. Now in practice, the feather um, has more acceleration due to air resistance, which actually slows, keeps it from getting fast as quickly. Um, it does doesn't accelerate as fast because the acceleration from air resistance is in the opposite direction. So in practice, if you do this experiment, a hammer and a feather will fall at slightly different times if it's a little slower. Um, it's going to depend a bit on the weights of the objects. If you do things that are reasonably heavy, um, so not getting bonked around, I think I can't do an experiment live, but if they're, they're re reasonably heavy, then they're, um, they basically have the same um, the exact same acceleration. And they actually did do this on the moon at one point and demonstrate that they, they did land at the same time. And that's one of the core principles that I would expect someone coming out of an introductory physics class to know. You should know that if you drop two objects at the same time, they will land at the same time. Okay. And then we have a bunch of equations. Um, which describe what happens. So um, we say the acceleration, usually we draw our coordinate system so that up is positive y. If it's one dimensional motion, you're just dropping something off of a building. Um, you can make, you can drop the vector symbols. So up is positive y, and the acceleration is negative um, 9.8 meters per second squared, no matter what the object is. And then 
for, for free fall, we also will call this negative G. G is the constant and the negative sign is fixed by your, your choice of coordinate systems. You almost always make um, the same choice, but, um, but we put the constant, G is a constant and, the, um, and we choose the acceleration to be down. And then for any type of free fall, the final velocity is equal to the initial velocity plus the acceleration times time. So for any type of one dimensional motion or later we'll turn this into a vector equation for specifically free fall, that's negative G as long as you've defined the coordinate system so that, it, so that things falling are negative. So you're, so it's opposite of falling means opposite of positive, then you're good. Um, and then you can write a uh, final exposition is equal to the initial exposition um, plus the velocity, the initial velocity times time plus one half times the initial times the, ex sorry, this should be in general, it's acceleration times time squared. Um, and again, specifically for free fall, that acceleration is always G. So this is showing you what happens. So at the very beginning, the objects are, um, the object is not falling as quickly. And then between each of the different time intervals, the spacing gets larger and larger. And you'll be using those equations to, um, to solve the, um, to, to figure out when things land and such. We have a lot of examples in class. Um, in this example, so you could actually figure out um, how fast the ball is going. It says a baseball is hit straight up and is caught by the, the catcher um, five seconds later. So it has to be straight up because we're in one dimensional motion. So uh, we're only allowed to, to solve problems in one dimension so far. All right, so we said that the, the final velocity is equal to the initial velocity um, plus the acceleration times time. Now, it turns out that uh, you, the, the, these problems are symmetric. So if you have the ball falling, it has to have the final velocity has to be, have the same value as the negative velocity. Um, is, is, sorry, it has to be the negative initial velocity. Um, so here, um, if I know that the ball um, is caught by the catcher 10 second, five seconds later, um, then the initial velocity um, here, I can solve this. I have two times the initial velocity equals G times T or the initial velocity is equal to 9.8 over two, so 4.9 times five, and this is meters per second squared times seconds, so meters per second. And I just would like to point out that you can actually treat units like algebraic quantities and cancel them out. Always watch your units, a correct answer, double check whether or not you have a vector if the vector is what's asked for and you double check your units. Um, so 
here, I'm going to round 4.9 to 5, and we have that the initial velocity was about 25 meters per second. Now, you could solve this exactly if you didn't realize that the problem is symmetric, because you know that the initial, so that we have final position equals initial position plus velocity, the initial velocity times time. Um, plus the acceleration, which is negative, divided by 2. I'm going to just leave g over 2 t squared. And you can set the origin where it leaves. And here you have the, this. So v initial times time minus g t squared equals 0. And now. I can cancel some things out, and I am left with V initial equals G T over two, which is exactly what I got in a different way. Um, so if you start with the position equation, you can actually, you can solve it as well. Um, what you should do is start by writing what you know, not just the numerical values, but I like to jot down the equations which might be useful because that helps me see where I know everything and can only um, and I only have to solve for a couple of things. Or where I where I know everything and I'm just left with the, the math of solving it. All right, a rocket releases its booster at a given velocity and height. Um, so this is telling you now you're you do know these quantities, but you there you're not you don't know the exact value. So if you know the height, um, how high and how fast do the the um, does the booster go? So here the initial height. So you have that the initial y value is whatever the height is, and the um, you're given the initial velocity. We are going to draw our coordinate system with the positive y going up. So our, our initial velocity is going to be positive. Um, and how high and how fast does the booster go? So we are going to say y final equals y initial plus v initial t plus, well, this is the always free fall. So I can write negative g t squared. OK, so what I want to know for how high does the um, how high does the booster go? It's easy to solve for y final minus y initial equals v i t minus g t squared. Now, how high does it go? At the very top, the velocity is zero, so I can use v final equals zero equals v initial t or sorry v initial minus um minus g t okay so then and i get that v initial is equal to g t and let's see this i dropped the two here so y final minus y initial equals g t squared minus g over 2 t squared. So this is equal to, the additional height is equal to g over 2 t squared. Ah, I actually tripped myself up 
I did not remember to double check what we're looking for. We are asking for, we actually, we would want to know how fast. So we want to know, so given the initial, well, well, the fastest it goes is the initial velocity. So we know that because it was really given in the problem. And how high does it go? Um, you could solve this. And here I solve in terms of T, but I can also write that T is equal to VI over G. And then I have G over two, VI squared over G squared. So how high does it go? is going to be v i squared over 2 g. So that's actually solved in terms of the things that we were given in the problem. All right, now there's a lot of problems very similar to that that you're going to see. Um, throughout this chapter is very important. You gotta know this stuff forwards and backwards because we're gonna start building on it um, again and again. So make sure that you get this information really down really well because when we get to looking at three dimensions, we're using vector um, equations and those are gonna be much less familiar. <laughs>